Hey, what's up you lot? My name's Path and first and foremost I want to say to you guys I hope you're all doing okay in terms of the uh, the outbreak, the outbreak that shall not be named uh, and I hope you're safe and I hope you're managing to look after yourselves and you've got supplies and all of that, I hope you're doing okay. In this video I want to take your mind and mine off this whole coronavirus outbreak and I want to talk to you about diffraction. Specifically I want to talk to you about why diffraction happens and give you a way of visualizing why it might be happening. So specifically here, we're talking about the diffraction of waves. Diffraction is a behavior displayed by waves, just like reflection or refraction. And so today I want to spend a little bit of time talking about what diffraction actually is, as well as going into a little bit more of an advanced concept and talking about why it might be happening. Don't worry though, as always, if you understand high school maths or high school physics, then you should be okay in understanding this video, if I've made it correctly. You don't need to be a physics student at university level to understand what I'm going to be talking about here. Before we get into it though, I want to let you guys know that I'll be leaving timestamps down in the description box below, so if you want to skip certain parts of the video because you know about what I'm going to be talking about already, then definitely do check it out. Or if you want to watch the whole video, then that's cool too. Let's get into it. Now first of all, what exactly is diffraction? Well, to answer this question, let's imagine a wave of light moving from left to right like this. We're looking at the wave from above, and this particular kind of wave is known as a plane wave. It's known as a plane wave because it looks like a two-dimensional flat surface, a plane, kind of. If we looked at the wave from the side, if we placed our eye here and we looked at the wave, what we'd be seeing is the wave oscillating up and down. The way that we draw this first diagram up above is that every single straight line corresponds to a peak of the wave and the distance between two peaks obviously is going to be a trough. Now this plane wave, this wave of light we were saying, is moving from left to right toward a material that's not going to let any light through it. But interestingly this material also has a little gap, it's got a little slit in it and the wave, the light wave, can travel through this slit. So if our wave moves toward this material with a slit in it what does the wave look like after having passed through that slit? Does it just look like this? No, it doesn't. Actually, what the wave looks like upon passing through the slit is this. You can see near the ends of the slit, the wave actually bends. This is what diffraction is. It's the bending of a wave as it passes through a slit or around an object, and it's a really interesting phenomenon to study. Now, when people first learn about diffraction, when in my own experience, when I first learned about diffraction, it's a real mystery as to why waves behave like this. Why are they bending? Why wouldn't they just travel straight through? This particular scientific model I'm going to be talking to you about is going to help you visualize why waves behave this way rather than just accepting that they do. So what is this magical model that I'm going to be telling you about? Well, the first version of this model is known as Huygens's wavelets. This is named after Christian Huygens, a Dutch physicist. Huygens proposed that waves moving through space can be thought of in the following way. He proposed that every single point along a wave front, let's say every single point along this peak of this particular wave, behaves like a source of that kind of wave. So if we just think about one particular point on our peak, on our wave front right now, that particular point, he said, behaves like a source of the light waves. Those light waves move away from that source or propagate from that source, and they move away in all directions at the same speed. So what you've got is this point emitting a sphere of waves. Because if waves are moving away from that point in all directions at the same speed, then what you get is a spherical shape. I'm just drawing 2D here, I'm not going to draw a whole 3D sphere because things are going to get really messy really quickly. So we've drawn these waves propagating from this point, this red point, on our wavefront. Huygens said that every single point on the wavefront emits these kinds of waves, and these waves being emitted from these points are known as secondary waves. Let's draw in a couple more points. I'm not going to draw every single point, obviously, because there's infinitely many of them along our straight line, but if we draw a couple more, we'll be able to visualize what he was trying to get at. What we'll be thinking about is what happens when secondary waves from this point and secondary waves from this point interact with each other, when they meet each other. Well, these secondary waves are going to behave just like any other kind of wave. They're going to interfere. What do we mean by interfere? Well, let's take a quick moment to talk about wave interference. Let's momentarily put aside what we've been talking about so far. Let's not imagine our light wave passing through a slit or anything like that. Let's imagine we've got two sinusoidal waves that look like this. Now we're looking at them from the side so we can see their peaks and troughs. And these two waves are the waves of the same kind, firstly, so they might be both light waves or both water waves or something like that. And secondly, just to make things easier for ourselves, we're going to say they have the same amplitude and they have the same wavelength. 
The only difference between these two waves is that they are moving toward each other, which inevitably means that at some point in time, they're going to overlap, they're going to meet each other. What happens in that situation? Well, when two waves of the same kind meet each other, essentially they form what's known as a resultant wave. This resultant wave is simply found by adding the displacements at every single point along our dotted line of the two original waves. And it doesn't have to be two waves, it could be three or four or however many. So let's now take a snapshot of our two waves at this point in time. Right now what we can see is that, let's say, the peak of the first wave coincides with the trough of a second wave. And so the resultant wave, the wave that's formed by these two waves combining together, is simply found by adding the displacements of these two original waves. The displacement of the first wave is this much in the upward direction, and the displacement of the second wave is this much in the downward direction. Because we're dealing with waves with the same amplitudes, these two happen to exactly cancel each other out. And so the resultant wave at this point is going to have a displacement of zero. Because these two waves are cancelling each other out. You've got a peak and you've got a trough, those cancel each other out to give zero. And in this particular moment in time, that's true for every point along the length of the wave. You've got a small upward displacement cancelled out exactly by a small downward displacement here. At this point, you've got zero displacement on the first wave and zero displacement on the second wave, so those add together to give zero anyway. And so the resultant wave at this particular point in time looks like a flat line. There's no oscillations. Now remember, when two waves combine, they meet, we don't actually see the two individual waves, we just see the resultant. The only reason we've drawn the two individual waves is to help us, you know, add them together so we can see what the resultant would be. And we can actually move these two waves along so they're still traveling in opposite directions. Let's now pause it at this point in time. Now what we've got is, let's say for example, when this wave is at a peak, the other wave is also at a peak. We've got an upward displacement on the first wave and another upward displacement on the second wave. Those add together to give a much bigger displacement in our resultant wave. And similarly here, we've got a trough and another trough. Those add together to give a massive downward displacement. And so at this point in time, our resultant wave looks like this. This is what we mean when we're talking about interference. When two waves combine by adding their displacements together at every single point in space and time. What we see is the resultant wave. We don't actually see the two or however many there are original waves. And so this is interference, or at least a very basic description of it. It's by no means comprehensive, so if you want to learn more about interference, then I'll leave some useful resources in the description below. So with all of that in mind, let's go back to our situation from earlier. What we had was a wave, a plane wave, moving from left to right. It doesn't have to be a plane wave, but in this case it is. What Huygens proposed was that every single point along a wavefront on that wave behaved as a source of that wave. And so we drew in three different points along this particular peak of our wave. We only drew in three points because our diagrams are going to get messy, but remember that we could have drawn a point anywhere along that line. In fact, we should have drawn a point everywhere along that line. But let's now look at what happens when the waves from two of these points interfere with each other. Since each line that we've drawn represents a peak, when two peaks overlap, remember from our interference discussion a moment ago, we get a much larger peak. To make things more simple, let's only worry about the peaks now. We're not going to worry about troughs or anything like that, but we'll be able to work out where the troughs are later. They'll be between peaks. So when two peaks from these two different point sources overlap with each other, we get a peak in our resultant wave, which is the wave that we actually observe. And this is really important to realize, because now, if we add in a few more point sources along our straight line, and we draw in the waves that they've been emitting as well, then what we see is that there's a straight line that's formed of all the peaks overlapping with each other. Lots of waves are interfering at this point, lots of spherical waves are interfering. But the end result, the resultant wave that we find, is a straight line that is a peak here. And so if we now get rid of all the spherical waves emitted by each one of these points along our wavefront, which remember we can't even see because those are the waves being interfered with each other, we only see the resultant wave, the resultant wave looks something like this. So essentially what we've been able to do is to play the wave forward like we would, you know, a video or a movie. We said initially that the front of the wave was here, and that wave front emitted lots of little secondary waves, and those combined together to give us another peak at this position here. So what's happened is the wave is moving forward. And this is the beauty of Huygens' proposal. Because we can't see the secondary waves, because we only see the resultant waves, he is saying that this might be a way of explaining how waves can propagate, how waves can move through space. And we'll talk about the good and the bad things about his mathematical model. 
Firstly, let's talk about why his mathematical model is a good one. You might be thinking this is way too complicated to describe just how a simple plane wave moves through space. It just needs to move from left to right, doesn't it? Well, the strengths of this model come in when we think about our wave passing through a slit. When our wave passes through a slit, remember the material either side of the slit absorbs all waves. So the only bits of wave passing through the slit are the bits that can pass through the slit, are the bits that are actually going through the slit. And then just as the very front of the wave has passed through the slit, Let's now pause our wave here and imagine our little spherical waves coming from the front of this wave. We see that once again along this part of the wave when those spherical waves combine together, when they interfere, we see a straight line. So the wave is propagating from left to right as we expected. But if we look really closely towards the ends of the slit, let's firstly focus on the top end of the slit. That point is releasing spherical waves and there are no waves above it to interfere with it because those were absorbed by the material. Therefore, above this point, we can't imagine points that are releasing secondary waves because there's no wave there. So what's going to happen to the secondary waves being emitted by a point very, very close to the end of the slit? There's not going to be any interference from waves above it. So it's just going to carry on this way. And so our resultant wave, if we just draw in the resultant wave, ends up looking a bit like this. Does that look familiar? This is exactly what we were talking about at the beginning of the video. Waves will bend when passing through a slit. And Huygens' mathematical, or rather geometric model, Huygens' wavelets, predicts that this will happen. So in that respect, this is a good model for waves. It does correctly predict the behavior of waves when passing through a slit. However, some of you may have noticed some problems with this model. Firstly, if we're going to imagine that every single point along our wave emits secondary wavelets, then it's all well and good thinking about what happens on this side of the wave. But what about this side? Well, because these spherical waves are exactly the same on this side as they are on the other side, what Huygens' wavelets is telling us is that there should also be a wave propagating backward. And that's not what we observe experimentally. Experimentally, we observe that the wave just propagates forward. We don't really see a backward propagating wave. So what do we do? We fix our model. This brings us onto a scientist named Fresnel. Fresnel realized the problems with Huygens' model, and he modified Huygens' model to fix these issues. Firstly, he came up with something known as the obliquity factor. Sounds really posh, sounds really like technical, but essentially all you need to know about it is the following. Secondary waves propagating from these point sources don't have to be of the same strength in every single direction. What do I mean by this? Well, the amplitude of the secondary wave moving in this direction does not have to be the same as the amplitude of the secondary wave moving in this direction. In other words, Fresnel said these spherical points don't emit waves that are exactly the same in all directions. In the forward direction, they emit relatively high amplitude waves. In the backward direction, they emit zero amplitude waves. They basically don't emit waves in the backward direction at all. And in directions in between, the strengths change as we go from backward facing to forward facing. And that's where the obliquity factor is. It just determines the strength, or rather the amplitude, of the waves being emitted in any given direction by any one of these points that emit secondary waves. So it kind of seems like a little bit of a fudge, and that's exactly what it is. It's almost a mathematical trick, mathematical manipulation, to make the model fit our observations. So Fresnel came along and fixed that with his obliquity factor. But he also had to make one other slight tweak to make sure that the waves predicted by this mathematical model, made now by Huygens and Fresnel, behaved exactly like waves do in real life. He had to slightly tweak the phases of the secondary waves coming from every single point along our wavefront. Basically, this is best described diagrammatically. Huygens originally said waves have to look like this, whereas Fresnel came along and said they don't have to, they could look like this. So Fresnel came along and he took Huygens' model and modified it in two ways. He added the obliquity factor and he changed the phases of the waves in different directions. This modified model that he created, technically a new model itself, was known as the Huygens-Fresnel principle. And the Huygens-Fresnel principle is a much better predictor of how waves behave in real life than Huygens' original mathematical model. And so my aim in this video was to discuss Huygens' wavelets as well as the Huygens-Fresnel principle with you to maybe help you visualize a little bit one way in which waves can propagate, but also why they bend when they pass through slits. So with all of that being said, I'm going to end my explanation here. I feel like this was a complicated one. So if you want me to explain something more clearly, if there's something I haven't explained well enough, then let me know in the comments down below. And as always, if I've made a mistake, let me know down below as well. I have an announcement to make, by the way. I've just very recently started up my second YouTube channel. It's known as Path G's Shenanigans. 
primarily I'll be posting music on there. You know, music I've recorded recently, as well as covers of stuff and, you know, discussions about music and reviews of music that I like, stuff like that. But mainly music that I've been recording because I wanted to have somewhere where I can put that out there. So if you like listening to sort of metal, fusion, progressive, gent, that kind of thing, uh, or you want to check out my second channel, then head over to Path G Shenanigans and uh, give it a subscribe if you're interested. And of course, if you enjoyed this video, then please do leave a thumbs up and let me know in the comments down below what other videos you want me to make in regards to physics, what concepts you want me to explain or try and explain. And subscribe to my channel if you haven't already and feel free to hit the bell button if you want to be notified every time I upload. I try and post nowadays every two weeks on Tuesday evenings at 4 p.m. UK time and I'm going to try and stick to this uploading schedule. I hopefully will be able to carry this on for a little bit longer. As always, I really enjoy making these videos and I really appreciate all your support. With all of that being said, I'll see you really, really soon. Bye-bye-bye-bye. I'm going to have to read really far now.